We'll get uh, Bruce and Warwick up here. standing up here, the first thing he'd say would be, uh, I need earplugs, because all your shirts are too loud. <laughs> uh, look, you sort of heard the story of all the record shops we've all worked at, and when I look around the room, I, you know, so many people who are part of that, uh, the family tree of people who worked in Melbourne record shops would be, it, it would make a Fleetwood Mac family tree look simple. Um, <laughs> But it's not just that family and, and that community of people that we're all part of. It's, it's all of the customers and um, and I see so many people here who I think were served by Steve when they were in school kid uniforms and, uh, uh, you know, now they're the heads of Music Victoria and uh, other successful things. Steve loved music. He loved it with a passion, um, amongst other things. And he, uh, he was a mentor to us. Uh, um, he loved a story. I'd even this year I've heard him tell stories as he sells a record to a 16-year-old kid that's just like, wow, I've never heard that story before. It was full of passion. Um, there was even recently when he was, uh, he was telling some long-winded story to a, to a kid and uh, Delta Goodrum was standing there waiting to be served and uh, <laughs> he leans over, leans over and goes, I'll be with you in a minute, Dals. <laughs> Because uh, you know he was—he was, he was just—he was imparting that enthusiasm, and uh, and and one of the things that uh, he taught the people he worked with is that enthusiasm and passion is is so important. It's so contagious. Um, doing that with a smile on your face is um, is a wonderful thing. And uh, this is going to be rambling because I'm partly a little bit teary and trying to hold that back. But uh, um, as yeah, as as JBG said. Um, the, um, I tried to organise having a meeting when I when I became part of the uh, Greville family again, 30 years after I was, uh, and Steve was like, don't get all professional on me. So I, I worked out a way to do it. I said, why don't we go and have a beer? And that, that, that was fine, so we did. And unfortunately, I, I was sitting down at the, having a beer and chatting about stuff, and I said, you know, can we talk about marketing? Steve goes, oh. <laughs> But what do you mean? We sell records. Isn't that marketing? <laughs> oh, forget about it. The, um, the amazing thing, I, I knew Steve and Warwick so well over so many years. We'd worked together and in, you know, put out Warwick's band's records and Steve had managed to know and we'd worked at GoGo and da da da. But when I came into Greville, I came into this weird situation where two people, they were almost telepathic. And, <laughs> And it was the odd couple too. Um, <laughs> they both just did their thing, and I had to try and guess how it all worked because there was no systems. Steve had a set of systems. Warwick had a set of systems, and it somehow made sense. And uh, but I'd get very frustrated at first. I'd, I'd be going, "I know these guys. I can work this out. We'll put some systems in place." And Steve would just look across at me and he to quote from. Uh, Todd Browning's uh, 1930s film, The Freaks, and he quoted from a lot of films, he'd lean over and go, one of us, one of us. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I'm not sure where I'm going with all this. Let's see uh, something about jokes. I couldn't ask a simple question, Steve. If I, if I said, have you seen The Ruler? He'd go, oh no, Warwick's gone home. <laughs> And there were other times I'd, I'd go, you know, where's the stapler? And I, and I could see his head going, duh, 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 duh. and I'd go, no, stop it, Steve, just please, don't. I just want the stapler. But yeah, you had to learn to work around that. The, uh, um, but then in the last week, Warwick and I have been through quite a lot, and it's been, um, it's been quite traumatic, um, but it's, uh, um, and I was saying to Warwick, what, what have we learned from Steve? And, um, Warwick made a really good comment to me last week, and he just said, "Sorry about doing this uh, with a with a quaver in my voice." But uh, Warwick said, "Being around Steve made me want to be a better person," and I went, "Yeah, you're right." Um, that was Steve, and I've got to end on one of Steve's jokes. He would have, he 
he said, he used to say, treat every sandwich like it could be your last. And, uh, <laughs> he also said, there's no pockets in a shroud. And, <laughs> um, and I just feel so lucky to have worked with him. And Warwick's got to say something. So. All right. <laughs> Where do I start? How, how I follow all of this, um, I started working with Steve, I'd moved up from the country in 1984, though he says it was 1983, so it was probably 1985, <laughs> and I was just a new kid and was a bit intimidated by the whole cool record shop, and the Missing Link was the coolest place in the world, and I'd, I'd had a bit of experience with the one down in Geelong, so they called me up and said, come work at Missing Link in Melbourne to fill in for Debbie. And um, I was like, okay, you know, how do I fit in with this? And Steve was the boss. And I think by the end of the first week, all I really had to do to sort of get through the job was sort of laugh at his jokes, <laughs> uh, make up jokes, play cramps and Sonic Youth records. And that seemed to be about, about it. And just talk, if I wanted to talk footy and that. And he recommended that I go to Gravel, maybe to get rid of me, or maybe to um, whatever, but I ended up in Gravel in 1984, five. And 10 years later, when Ogogo, I think, went under, I just rang up Steve and like, no, you're not working, come work. And he was like, what do I do? And I'm like, I don't know, just come. So we've spent 24, 25 years working together. Um, and separately, and he was my brother, he was like a best friend. He also, I know a lot of people talk about the jokes and stuff, and there was, was a lot of that, but he did treat everyone so awesomely. Uh, he didn't care who you were, he could have been the local postman that never bought a CD, that just dropped in every day. He could have been a famous, God, how many famous people did we sell records to, you know? Uh, he, he didn't really give a shit who you were, you're all, you're all on the same level, and it, it actually is true, he treated everyone well, never spoke badly about people, and he did actually make me at times, through not meaning to, make me want to be a better person. He didn't have a dishonest moment in his life. I don't think he told a single lie in his life. So he had a lot of dignity and a lot of really great qualities behind that jovial, fun guy that you knew. He had these qualities that you know, and I look at the girls that I called this week that worked for us. You know, he was like a brother to all of those people and they all spoke about that. He was like a, he was more than, oh, we didn't really work together. Like Bruce said, we didn't have a, we never had a business meeting. We didn't even talk about business. We just turn up to work, stock good records, sell them. And um, that's about all you really need to do. And I could go on forever, but it's really, like Bruce said, it's been a really huge uh, week for all of us. It's just come out of nowhere. <clears throat> we didn't see it coming. Uh, we've been talking about the fact that we're all getting ready to maybe retire one day and looking forward to that, planning for it. And the most shittiest things just come along and uh, happened. And the response has been incredible. Everyone's been really beautiful. The messages we've had, the people who've come to the shop, he'd be really blown away by it, and you've all been incredible. So he'd probably want to end it saying, you know, his joke was, the pleasure is yours, and the truth is, it really was ours. So if you've got a drink, I would just want you to raise your glasses. And if you don't have a drink, just do whatever you want to do. And here's to you, Katie.